Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Anyone who has done anything in the world of radio has at least heard of Q. They may have even had to answer a question or two about it for a license exam. Now, my experience has been that most people don't really understand it. For some, the mention of Q brings back memories of Star Trek episodes and the continuum. Well, in this video, I'm going to talk about the ethereal topic of Q as it relates to electronics, not Star Trek. So, what is Q? Why do I care about it? How do I calculate it? Now, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, we will begin by looking at Q as it relates to the components themselves. In short, Q stands for quality factor. It can apply to component level quality factor in inductors and capacitors. You can specifically buy capacitors and inductors that are marked as high Q components. Real world capacitors and inductors have some non-ideal characteristics among which is the inherent resistance associated with them. With inductors, it is simple series resistance, also known as their DC resistance or DCR. With capacitors, it's not just this simple series resistance, also known as equivalent series resistance or ESR, it is also the resistance associated with their leakage current. We place these latter ones in parallel with the ideal capacitor in our capacitor model. These non-ideal characteristics serves to limit the ideal inductor or capacitor so that it cannot be its ideal self. The higher the resistance value of these series resistances, the less the component can act like an ideal component and thus the lower the quality of the component. In the capacitor, the higher the leakage current and thus the smaller the parallel resistance, the less it can act like an ideal capacitor. This also impacts the quality of the capacitor. The more like their ideal selves these components can act, the higher their quality factor or Q. So, how do we calculate the Q of a component? If we consider the impedance of a capacitor or inductor as impedance is equal to R plus XJ at any particular given frequency, then the equation for Q becomes X divided by R, or the reactance of the component at the frequency in question divided by the inherent resistive component of the component at that same frequency. Because any number divided by zero yields an infinite result, you can see that if we have a perfect component where R is zero across all frequencies, then Q will be infinite for that component. Now, you will notice that the Q of a component could potentially be frequency dependent, depending on what R does as frequency changes. In my experience, for the most part, we don't need to actually measure the Q of a capacitor or inductor. The process of actually measuring the Q of a component is not so easy. Now, sure, the Nano VNA will report the Q of a component when you measure it, but you'll also notice that this Q value will vary widely as you take repeated readings. Now, with this said, you can get some idea of whether it is a high or a low Q component in this way. Now, one thing I'd like to point out to you in a very practical way is an observation that I made while investigating the Q of various capacitors. I discovered that the Q of the very high voltage capacitors like this doorknob 40 kilovolt capacitor or my 30 kilovolt uh, blue little capacitor was atrociously low. Now, this is my limited experience with a couple that I have in hand like this one. Now that you know what makes up the Q of a component, you have a better idea of what to look for. Now, let's talk about how Q applies to a resonance circuit. Well, in the case of the resonance circuit, Q refers to the extent to which that circuit acts like it has been built with ideal components. The higher the quality factor rating, 
the better the resonance circuit is at acting like an ideal resonance circuit. So what does an ideal resonance circuit look like? Let's start with a series resonance circuit. A perfect series resonance circuit made with perfect components will act like a dead short at resonance. If I make this circuit, the output side of a voltage divider, then the output voltage would drop to zero volts at resonance. The voltage across the series resonance circuit would look like this as we pass the frequency of resonance. But there's no such thing as perfect components. Now, suppose I add a very, very modest 0 0.01 ohms in series with the capacitor and the inductor to simulate the non-ideal characteristics of some real-world components using exactly the same circuit as before. Now, how does the voltage look as compared to its ideal cousin? Well, here it is. The orange line is the ideal version. The blue line is the non-ideal version. Yep, that's it down there in the middle. <laughs> With that said, if we look at this all by itself, it actually doesn't look that bad. The difference between 49 megahertz and the resonant frequency of 50 megahertz is still 36 dB. But as compared to its ideal cousin, Ugh. Now, let's switch this up and replace the series resonant circuit with a parallel resonant circuit and do the same thing. A perfect parallel resonant circuit made with perfect components will act as a perfect open at resonance. This is what the output of our voltage divider looks like as we sweep across the resonant frequency. As we approach resonance, the parallel resonance circuit becomes an open circuit. So you can see the output voltage rise. It rises all the way up to the value of the input voltage. The peak is very, very sharp. Again, like before, let's add a very modest 0 0.01 ohms as series resistance to both the capacitor and the inductor. Now we get this. You can see how even a little real-world resistance makes a huge difference in the height of the peak. Now, it's interesting to note that the actual width of the base didn't change much, just the height of the peak. So now that we can see how real-world non-ideal characteristics can affect the performance of a tuned circuit, how does this relate to the Q value of that circuit? Well, the Q of a resonance circuit is defined using the following formula. Q is equal to the resonant frequency of the circuit divided by the bandwidth of the circuit. So how do we define the bandwidth of a resonance circuit? Well, here, let me show you. So here's my nice frequency response curve for my circuit. The first step is to determine the maximum response point of the circuit. Here you can see that it is at 50.00012 MHz with a value of minus 0.89 dB. Next, we want to locate the points where this response is 3 dB less than this maximum. In this case, it is 3 dB down from the minus 0.89 dB, which would be minus 3.89 dB. Now we find the frequencies where this exists in this particular response curve. And here we can see that they exist at 49.9852 MHz and 50.01503 MHz. So the difference between these two frequencies where the minus 3 dB points are determines the bandwidth of this response. So what do we get? We have 50.01503 minus 49.9852, which gives us a bandwidth of 0.02983 megahertz. So now that we know the bandwidth and we know the center frequency, we can calculate the Q of this tuned circuit. Q is equal to the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth, so we have 
0.00012 megahertz divided by 0.02983 megahertz, which gives us a Q of 1,676. Wow, this is a very respectable Q, which is attained with components that have a 0 0.01 ohm internal resistance. And by the way, these are somewhat a rare commodity. But how would this look if we talk about components with maybe 0.1 ohms of internal resistance? Still, seemingly a low value. So we get this new waveform and we go through all the same steps. First, we locate the maximum, which is, as before, at 50.00012 megahertz, with a value of minus 20.886 dB. Then we locate the minus 3 dB points. Now, these come out to be residing at 48.84372 megahertz and 50.15652 megahertz. This gives us a bandwidth of 0.3128 megahertz. So let's do the math. We have a center frequency of 50.00012 megahertz, and we have the bandwidth. We're gonna divide that center frequency by the bandwidth that we determined was 0.3128 megahertz, which gives us a Q of 159.8. Now, notice that the actual skirts of this response lay in the same place. But because the peak is so much lower, the 3 dB points lay further out, giving us a wider bandwidth and a, and a lower Q. Well, I'm hoping that this gave you a little better feel for what Q is and how it affects what we do in radio communications. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.